The Lord be with you. We welcome you to Zion today. We're glad to have you with us. Hey, if there's an usher, I think we missed a switch. Because that one, unless the light burned out, otherwise we wouldn't just flip that on, that'd be great. Hey, uh, a lot of things happening in the life of Zion. I want to give you a, a heads up on some of the things going on uh, today and throughout the week. So after worship today in the fellowship hall, there, that was wonderful. In, in, thank you very much. In the fellowship hall, you will see a lot of baked goods, and they look fantastic. And those are free will offering. Uh, now, so there's this side we normally go through will be the fellowship time, go through and get food to eat after church, okay, just as normal. On this side, you will see a row of baked goods, and those are free will offering, and the free will offering goes to support, uh, to help defer some of the costs for Janet Smith as she's gone through if you, if you know Janet and you've, been, and you've kept up a little bit on uh, her journey over the last year or so uh, with some of the, um, I don't know what the this bone up here is called, but with, with the, the cancer that was located up here, which required uh, replacement of like a regrafting of bone in, in the facial place. And then the, she had gotten an infection in that here last fall. And that's required some pretty extensive treatment and medication and so forth. And you all know um, we are very grateful for our medical system, but it's certainly not free. <laughs> and uh, that's brought with it significant uh, medical expenses for Janet. And those will, uh, the bait goods that you purchase will go to defer that cost. You don't have to buy anything if you don't want to. If you want to just give an offering, you know, a gift, you're welcome to do that. It's all free will offering, so that's after worship today. So I invite you to be a part of that. Uh, let's see now. This evening, well, then after that time, we go to our Bible class time. And remember in our family Bible hour, we're talking about how we got the Bible. It's a fascinating study. I hope you can hang around and be a part of that conversation. I think you'll find it edifying. This evening, from 6.30 to about 7.45 or so, we have our Smart Money, Smart Kids. That's for tweens and teens and parents. And we invite you to be a part of that this evening as well. So that's coming up. And, and if you weren't here the first week, it's okay. You can join us yet tonight. Uh, and what that does, though, by being a part of that class, it gives you access to all the online resources, which are excellent online resources. But we encourage you to be here this evening for that. And then next Sunday is our Generations Sunday. So that's going to involve a lot of different people in different age groups. So some of you who are brass players, I've asked you to play for that service. If you don't have the music, let, let me know, and I'll get you in touch with uh, Tim Keenest, who has the trumpet piece, trombones, you just simply play out of the hymnal. But we'll do that uh, next Sunday. If we get a practice time, Tim, let me know. I don't know if we have that figured out yet, but we'll try to get at least one practice time. Maybe it's just before church next week, because they've played the piece before. So that's next week. Also, a variety of other participants during that service. I'm excited. I won't tell you all the details now, but be present to that. It's always a fun service. We encourage you to be a part of that. Okay. There are lots more announcements here for you to take note of. I ask you to take time to look at those as you have time. But we're ready to turn to our opening song.
please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Do you believe that you are a sinner? Yes, I believe it. I am a sinner. How do you know this? From the Ten Commandments, which I have not kept. Are you sorry for your sins? Yes, I am sorry that I have sinned against God. What have you deserved from God because of your sins? His wrath and displeasure, temporal death, and eternal damnation. Do you hope to be saved? Yes, that is my hope. In whom then do you trust? In my dear Lord Jesus Christ. What has Christ done for you that you trust in him? He died for me and shed his blood for me on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. Let us then confess our sins to God, asking him to forgive us for Christ's sake. I, a poor sinner, plead guilty before God of all sins. I have lived as if God did not matter and as if I mattered most. My Lord's name I have not honored as I should. My worship and prayers have faltered. I have not let his love have its way with me, and so my love for others has failed. There are those whom I have hurt and those whom I have failed to help. My thoughts and desires have been soiled with sin. I am sorry for all of this and ask for grace. I want to do better. Do you believe that the forgiveness I speak is not my forgiveness, but God's? Yes. Let it be done for you as you believe. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God! The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Almighty God, we give thanks for all your goodness and bless you for the love that sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, and whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your holy church for the means of grace, for the lives of all faithful and just people, and for the hope of the life to come. Help us to treasure in our hearts all that you have done for us and enable us to show our thankfulness in lives that are wholly given to your service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Save and defend your whole church, purchased with the precious blood of Christ. Strengthen your faithful people through the word and the holy sacraments, making them perfect in love and in all good works, and establish in, the, in, in them the faith once delivered to the saints. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Preserve our nation in justice and honor, that we may lead a peaceable life with integrity. Grant health and favor to all who bear office in our land, especially the President and Congress of the United States, the Governor and Legislature of Iowa, and to all those who make, administer, and judge our laws. Help them to serve this people according to your holy will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Take from us all hatred and prejudice. Give us the spirit of love and order our days in your peace. Prosper the labor of those who work to bring peace and justice to the nations of the world. 
that mutual understanding and common endeavor may be increased among all peoples. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sanctify our homes with your presence and bless them with joy. Keep our children in the covenant of their baptism and enable their parents to bring them up in lives of faith and devotion. Unite the members of all families in a spirit of affection and service that they may show your praise in our land and in all the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let your blessing remain upon the seed time and harvest, the commerce and industry, the leisure and rest, the arts and culture of our people. Take under your special protection those whose work is difficult or dangerous and be with all who put their hands to any useful task. Give them the just rewards for their labor and the knowledge that their work is a blessing in your sight. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. By your word and Holy Spirit, comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Be with those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those to whom death draws near. Bring consolation to those in sorrow and grant to all a measure of your love taking them into your tender care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you in your church on earth, who now rest from their labors. Keep us in fellowship with all your saints and bring us at last to the joys of your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things, and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, who governs all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the prayers of your people and grant us your peace through all our days. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 62. We begin with verse number 1. This is the promise of salvation for Zion. And what you see throughout the Old Testament is you have these, these types of salvation where God is announcing essentially here that they will be brought back from exile. But that in and of itself, although a historical event, is also meant to anticipate the greater gift of salvation that we have in Jesus. So here you have the Lord speaking through his prophet these words of great affection for his people that he has redeemed. We begin with verse 1. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more, no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul speaks about spiritual gifts or gifts from the Spirit. His emphasis is on many diverse gifts, one unifying Spirit. We begin with verse number one. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand and we sing together our Alleluia. Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. We begin with the first verse. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. 
Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. They took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drawn freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May be seated. Kids, come on up and find a seat. Okay, as you're finding a seat, I need three volunteers today. Isaiah, you want to come up here? You can hold, hold one of my signs. Okay, you want to hold one? Okay. Let me get it unstuck. There you go. And let's see. You want to hold one? Okay, good. Now, you have your signs face out. Now, in our gospel reading, John told us that Jesus changed the water into wine, and he said that this was the first of his signs. So I have up here for you three different signs. And you see these signs along the side of the road. Let's see how well you do. Does anyone know what this sign means? If you're driving, you see this sign. What's it mean? People are crossing the road, so what should you do if you're driving? You stop, pay attention, watch out for people, right? What, if you're driving and see this one, what's it mean? What do you think? There's a curvy road up ahead, right? And if you see this one, that means and if you're going this way, what are you doing? You're going the wrong way, right? Because what's the sign say? One way, you got to go that way. Okay, now, we put these signs up for a reason. Now, we don't put them up just so they're pretty and people can go, oh, look, there's a rectangle and there's a, there's a diamond and, and there's another diamond. Or, oh, look, that's a pretty yellow one, that's a pretty white one. These aren't little pieces of art on the side of the road, are they? In fact, have you ever seen somebody get out and take a picture next to one of these signs like this? Like, ooh, let me take a picture of that sign. That's a really pretty sign. No, because that's not the point of those signs, right? We didn't put the signs up to be pretty pictures on the side of the road. The point of the sign is to point us to something, right? To tell us a message, something important. That's what John is saying in our gospel reading. What Jesus did wasn't, the, the point wasn't the water into wine. The point was to point people to Jesus, just like these signs that are telling us something, they're pointing us somewhere. What Jesus did was pointing us to who he was and why he came. We're going to talk more about that in the message today, so I want you to listen for that. But remember, when you see these signs, just like the miracles that Jesus did, they weren't the point in and of themselves. They were signs pointing us to the point. And the point is Jesus and who he is and what he's done and continues to do for you. Okay? So listen in our sermon. We're going to talk more about signs today. But they function just like these signs to point us to something. And our signs in the Bible point us to Jesus. All right, thank you boys for holding those signs. Well done. You can head back to your seats and we'll sing our next song.
Grace to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God speaks to us today in our gospel reading from John chapter 2. Before we dive in, I need to offer a few words of prolegomena or explanatory introduction. There are some things you need to know before we really get going. So first, you need to remember the kind of literature you're reading. You need to know this because it affects the way you read it. So, for example, you'd read a comic book differently than you'd read um, the newspaper. And you'd read historical fiction differently than you would read a novel. The genre of the writing matters. So when we come to John, we need to understand that, first of all, we're not reading a, a bare historical telling of events. So... He's not simply saying in a sort of disinterested way, well, A happened, and then B happened, and then C happened. John is carefully crafting specific historic events into this narrative telling of Jesus' story. And he's really good at it. He incorporates patterns and themes. He weaves in all kinds of images and ideas from the Old Testament. And the great thing about his book is that some of these things, they don't become apparent the first time through. They don't don't become apparent the second time through. Sometimes it takes 10 or 11 times through before they start to pop out at you. And you start to go, wow, I never saw that before. This is far more complex and far more interesting than I realized. Right? So John, John makes some of these things obvious, but some of these things are very subtle. So the cool thing about it is you can read this book for a lifetime and never get tired of it. So he's doing history, but he's doing more than that. We, we could call this a prophetic history, a prophetic interpretation of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. John wants us to see that God is working through these events, that God is the one driving the story to bring salvation to the world, specifically to bring salvation to the world in Jesus. And he intentionally arranges his narrative to accomplish that purpose. So John makes this explicitly clear near the end of his carefully crafted telling. He says this, now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So at the very least, that means that we need to read John 2 with that in mind. Because there are all sorts of peripheral questions that, that the text raises, like, whose wedding was this? And where was Joseph? And why did Jesus respond so abruptly to Mary's statement? And why did Jesus well, mostly keep this miracle pretty quiet so only a few handfuls of people really knew what had happened? Now, those are interesting But John doesn't answer them because they are not his reason for writing. The reason he's writing is Jesus. He wants you to know Jesus so that you may have life in him, so that your kids and your grandkids can have life in Jesus. And this also means that many of us probably have gotten the point of this account wrong. So we're going to unpack this, but let me just say up front to get your attention, and I mentioned to the kids just briefly, but the point of our text is not the changing of the water into wine. It's not. We're going to come back to that. You hold that thought. In order to ensure that we don't miss the point, John has hung his narrative on three key words. And John returns to these three key words throughout the rest of his prophetic interpretation of history, throughout the rest of his gospel. So to ensure we get the point, 
I'm, I'm titling this sermon, Three Words, One Focus, Jesus. And here are the three words, our, sign, glory. Our, sign, glory. Let's just take them each in turn. Jesus and his disciples have accompanied Mary to a wedding celebration. Now, these were multi-day celebrations. They required mountains of food and rivers of wine. And the wine ran out. It's obviously a big deal. It's a huge embarrassment. And Mary says to Jesus, I have no wine. Now, let me just point out something here. We don't know any more than this. Right? Was Mary simply informing Jesus? Was she embarrassed for the family? Was she related to the family somehow? So this was personal to her? Was she insinuating that Jesus needed to do something? Was this some sort of coded language for, we need a miracle here, Jesus? Or something like, it's time to show everybody who you really are, Jesus. And we can make conjectures all day long based on Jesus' reply. But we have to be really careful not to say more than the text says. Because remember, John has a point. Jesus. And he's getting ready to share one of those key words that he's going to hang his narrative on that's going to point us to Jesus. So Jesus responds to Mary, woman, what does that have to do with me? Now, I admit, that's a surprising response, right? It's not rude. But it's certainly not typical, especially not from a son to a mother. It is, however, a distancing response. But we're simply going to have to leave it at that because our first key word shows up next. Jesus continues, my hour has not yet come. Strange, isn't it? It's a strange thing to say. What hour? Well, to find out, you have to read the rest of John's prophetic history, the rest of John's gospel. And over and over again, you hear Jesus say and John narrate, my hour, his hour, has not yet come. So you, as you read the gospel, you have this suspense that's building throughout John's prophetic telling where you keep asking, what is his hour? What is he talking about? What's he focused on? And when will his hour come? And that builds and it builds and it builds until you get to the brink of Jesus' crucifixion. And Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The hour. His hour was the cross. Now we're going to come back to that word glorified because it's another one of our key words, and it's astonishingly connected to the cross. But for now, we simply need to see that Jesus' hour, the hour for which he came, was the cross. And just saying that is remarkable. The hour, the reason, the goal for Jesus' coming was the cross. It wasn't some accident of history. This is where it was headed all along. And he was doing it for you. So any presentation of Jesus that denies or omits or ignores the cross, it's a false presentation. Any religion that omits the cross of Jesus or pushes it off to the periphery is a false religion. Any preacher who preaches a theology without the cross of Jesus Christ in its center is a false preacher. And I cannot overemphasize this because it's so easy to be taken in by false preachers, by preachers preaching a moral principle Jesus, a destiny Jesus, a success Jesus, a health and wealth Jesus, a love Jesus, an affirmation Jesus, a rainbow Jesus, an equity Jesus, and on and on it goes. But John wants us to see that Jesus came specifically for the cross. He came for sinners, sinners like you and me, because, because our sin is real. 
Because we mess around with drink and sex like they're trivial things, like they don't have the power to warp our soul. Because we fail at integrity and generosity. Because the things we think about one another, well, they're too dark and mean to say out loud. Because the way we treat God's name and the way we disregard worship and his word are worse than we're willing to acknowledge. Because we deceive ourselves with our own carefully crafted lies and justifications. Because we constantly blur the line between right and wrong always to benefit ourselves. John wants us to see that Jesus came specifically to die under the just wrath of God against our sin. He came to be our substitute, our propitiation, our redemption. That's the hour that Jesus is talking about. And as strange as it is in this text, as jarring as it is to hear Jesus seemingly raise this out of the blue, that's what he's talking about. That's his hour. Okay, that's our first word, hour. Let's go on to our second word, sign. Jesus has quietly changed the water into wine, into excellent wine, and the master of the feast is blown away by it. And John tells us, this the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. So if you read on in John's prophetic telling of history, you'll see that word sign show up 16 more times. So it's clearly an important word to John. In fact, John narrates seven specific signs, more than we have time to address here. But the changing of the water into wine is the first. But here's the thing we need to see, and the thing I pointed out with the kids. Signs point beyond themselves. I've said this before, bears repeating. The sign points to the point. Okay? So the signs aren't the point. Right? We get that with other signs in our lives, right? Like I mentioned with the kids, the road signs. They aren't the point, right? We don't post them along the sides of the road to add color and variety and geometric shapes to our otherwise monotonous drive. They deliver important messages to us. They tell us something. They point us to something. They aren't the point. They are the pointer to the point. That's what John is saying. This miracle, this turning of water into wine, like I said earlier, it wasn't the point. It was the pointer to the point. And the point was Jesus. The point of John's prophetic telling of history is Jesus. In fact, the whole Bible is about Jesus, about Jesus and the hour for which he came, the cross. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about glory. You heard what John said. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. Now, this is such an outstanding word. And to really appreciate what John is saying, we need to do a little bit of work here. So the word glory shows up all over the Bible. I mean, hundreds of times in the Bible. And at its most basic level, it means heavy or substantial. So you actually see it used to describe people of larger girth. The Hebrew word is kavod, glory, and they are described as having significant kavod. That's the Hebrew word for glory. But from that base meaning, then, it's used to describe a person's significance, his reputation, his honor, his gravitas. So if you've ever seen the presidential motorcade with police motorcycles, SUVs, limos, and all the Secret Service agents, probably some helicopters in the sky as well, if you were to speak biblically, with biblical words, about that scene, we would describe it as kavod, as the president's glory. It's substantial. All those vehicles and personnel point to the president's prominence, his importance, his glory. Or if you've ever been to Mount Rushmore and seen George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt's faces, then you've seen their kavod, their glory 
carved in stone. So the idea, again, is something that points to a per- person's gravitas, his reputation, his honor and importance and ethos. So when the Bible speaks of God's glory, it points to several things. Psalm 19 invites us to look up to the heavens above. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. So the heavens display God's gravitas, his reputation, his honor, his importance. The president has a few motorcycles, SUVs, and limos. God has glowing galaxies, blazing suns, and spinning planets. In Exodus, God's glory is described as a brilliant cloud and a devouring fire. God's glory leads the people through the wilderness. It enshrouds Mount Sinai, and it fills the tabernacle, later the temple. So it was this super intense and blazing light. That's God's glory. Now, there's some really remarkable stuff in Scripture about mankind bearing and sharing in that glory, about God crowning mankind with his glory as little rulers or regents over God's creation. But we're going to have to leave that to the side for now. But it's really astonishing stuff. In the New Testament, we see God's glory in Jesus Christ. So John famously writes, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And we read in our text for today, this the first of His signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested His glory. So changing water wine, instantaneously turning water into magnificent wine, along with all the rest of the signs and the miracles that Jesus did, they show Jesus' glory. They reveal his gravitas, his ethos, his reputation and power and importance. This man can turn water into wine with a word. This man can heal the sick with the word. This man can raise the dead with the word. This man's words have creative power. This man's words accomplish what he says. You might say, in fact, you would rightly say, this man's words have divine power, God power. And if you get that right, you're starting to get John's point and starting to see why Jesus demands, why his glory demands our attention. Because you've never seen anything like it. But if you know John's gospel, you know that this is just a glimpse of this man's glory. In fact, if you were listening carefully, you heard what we said just a few minutes ago. Jesus was on the brink of his crucifixion, and he says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The hour has come for the Son of Man to show his importance, to show his significance, to reveal his gravitas, his ethos, the things that revealed the weight of his person and mission. It's all laid out on the cross. That is Jesus' glory. He hangs there willingly for you. He suffers there willingly for you. He dies there willingly for you. This is his glory, not because it's beautiful to look at, but because it brings about a beautiful result, your forgiveness and your life and your salvation. And time prevents us from going into detail on this, but it ensures that you will share in, yes, share in God's glory forever, that you will wear and bear the glory of God, that his glory will be your glory, that his brilliance will be your brilliance, that his gravitas will be your gravitas, that his importance will be your importance. And I just run out of words here. I mean, this thought just brings me to the limits of my imagination. It makes me wonder why people and parents are beating down the doors of our church to have their children hear this why they aren't pouring their resources into churches to make it possible for as many people as possible to hear this, why they aren't doing everything in their power to make sure that this message not only gets into their own hearts, but into the hearts of their children and grandchildren. Because, you know, the world offers glory in presidential motorcades and mountainous stone faces. 
But God offers glory in the heavens and in the cross of Jesus Christ. Why would we settle for a lesser glory than that? Now, we're out of time. So let's review our simple point. Our sign glory. Three words, one focus, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Now the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord to life everlasting, amen. I invite you to stand. And we do this every week. But one of the reasons that when you hear me say we confess this with joy and boldness is I know something about habits. You habit your way into new ways of thinking. And the more gusto you put into this, the more real it becomes to you. So I encourage you, even if your neighbor looks at you like you're weird, you are. <laughs> it's okay. With gusto and boldness, we confess together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I invite Claire Gore forward. And as you're coming forward, Claire, I, I want to encourage you to listen to the words that Claire will sing. This is the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Beautiful words. Children, you can bring your offering forward. If you want to grab that basket, that'd be great. you notice, and our hymns are like this so often, how often it turns 
words of confession and words of praise into words of prayer. A beautiful uh, hymn sung very well. Thank you, Claire. But I would encourage all of us as we sing through our hymns to be mindful. Some are specifically praise-oriented, but some are specifically prayer-oriented. And that's why they're such great devotional tools for us not only to sing as families, but even if we don't sing, to study them because of the devotional value that they present. So thank you, Claire, again for sharing. Let us stand to pray. Lord God, we come before you just in awe of what we hear in your scriptures. When we consider the hour for which Christ came, the signs that point to Christ, the glory that he reveals, and the glory that we have the promise that we will share in, we simply run out of words to express our gratitude. Fill our hearts with joy and hope in these promises. Help us to bring our children, our grandchildren, our families to hear these promises. May these promises encourage those of us who are deep in grief to know that the promise of God's glory is a promise that all the shadows, all the sorrow, all the darkness and suffering will be overwhelmed with the light of God's presence and will finally and fully be free from all of it, standing in the light and the glory of God. Fill us with that hope in the midst of our sorrow. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Father, we pray for all who grieve, especially this week we remember the Stribe family as they grieve the death of Lowell. We ask that you would speak your word of comfort and promise into their family, that they may have certainty to know the promise of reunion, the promise of renewal, the promise of resurrection in Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. For those in need of your care, we name Jim Devers, Rick Spock, John Sonickson, Gage Carlson, David Bowman, Patty Meaves, Leggy Thompson, <clears throat> Justine Schwizo, Nancy Grimm, Julie Weller, Jeannie Groon, Sherry Steffes, Virgin Kruger, Janet Smith, Jean Mankey, Nina Pratt, Janice Munson, Annette Hilsebeck, Darlene Asmus, Amy Benton, Pastor Johnson, Jay Kuhn, Joeen Bowman. Give grace sufficient for each day and the healing that you have in store for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For pastors and missionaries, Pastor Oliver, Pastor Lopez, Pastor Ferry, Pastor Mark and Megan Monti, Pastor Sharp, also for Molly. We pray that you would give them joy and confidence as they share Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For law enforcement and military men and women, especially Scott Stribe, Stephen Grimm, Marshall Hansen, Aaron Stokel, and Lillian Ginzen, that you would protect them, Lord God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our preschool, the love of Jesus may be heard and confessed for our partnership with Trinity and Manila, that the gospel of Christ may be proclaimed and heard in faith, and the gospel of the kingdom go forward. These prayers we are bold to bring before you in the name of Jesus, and at his command and invitation we pray together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our final song is a straight-up hymn of praise, O Sing to the Lord. Thank you.